My father was uh, uh, what uh, it's called brilliant cutter, but he was also very good in doing this uh, stone engraving, and he was more interested to do this kind of engraving, this finer, more detail. And so uh, the reason why he did send me to be an apprentice for engraving, uh, so his aim was that I will once be a better cutter. That was his, to get his finer you know, training, to be able to do finer works in cutting. And in fact, uh, it happened, because I'm using the big clays and, and doing engraving. This, in the other ways than he thought, of course. Hello, welcome to the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass. My name is Bill Goodenrath and I'm the resident advisor here. This is the third in our series of master classes on videotape. This year's video is on Yerji Hartsuba, engraving on glass. In the world of contemporary glass, Yerji Hartsuba is a beloved figure and a legendary figure. Throughout his 60-year career, through his work and through his generous teaching, he has redefined the way we think of engraving on glass. Using traditional techniques, he has opened new doors for young artists and for his art. When I came to the glass factory as an engraver, it was lucky the designer was an old man, Rudolf Schweder, very good designer who would say the first information about Dominic Beeman what, and what engraving meant to the others, that it was a, the queen of all disciplines. Everybody, the glass blower, everybody would say this is a top of a skillness. But the, a very crossroad really was uh, the end of the war, 1945. Uh, not only that I was condemned to be just a, a helper because I was of Czech nationality and, and uh, so I couldn't go to any other school, uh, just to the elementary school. And also I didn't uh, get even a license that I am engraver. My father took me to Novi Bor and the first person I met in the school was Libensky. <laughs> I didn't know yet that it's that Slebensky had a mustache at that time. And so this was a real shock, a cultural shock, because all what all the aesthetics from Harakov was not anymore true. Because the the point of looking at art as Libensky and the others from the former students from the Academy young guys, 24 years, Libensky at the time. I was 17, you know. And I think it was a main uh, motor to drive all the people in, in a, to go for more than just, uh, just doing glass for a factory. So this Roman bottle from the beginning of the millennium is a good example for the students. It shows the engraving even if it's done in, on a rough wheel and in a very primitive, so-called primitive way, but it's very alive. This is engraved by Kaspar Lehmann to the end of the 16th century. Kaspar Lehmann was perhaps the first one who came from the gem engraving to the glass engraving. And you can see in his engraving again how good is used the wheel. And if you go very close, you can see it's really a cut engraving. Dominic Beeman 
was born 1800 in Harachov. It's the northeast of Bohemia, and he is acknowledged as the best engraver of all times, especially in portrait engraving. And he was a student of the uh, Academy of Fine Arts in Prague, so his uh, skillness of a sculptor who studied anatomy and drawing, everything is, you can see in his portraits. I mean, it's so sophisticated from the point of the technique of engraving, a kappa wheel engraving. And uh, in the same time, it still is not overworked. It has a balance between this sophisticated and refined uh, finish and you can still see the, the cuts of the wheel. If you go very close, you can see in the hairs and the, some details of the face. So this is an example of a folk art, a copper wheel engraving. You can see this white areas of uh, the copper wheel um, with uh, the grid of corundum and then the panties polished out with a lead wheel and that lead wheel was applied pumice. Uh, this is a portrait of Vladimir Kopetsky. Uh, uh, we studied together since 1945 and we used to teach together at the Academy of Applied Art and he's still there. This piece I made uh, 95 for the Rakov Commissions of the Konig Museum of Glass. And I did this piece on a big lace. It's uh, rather big stone wheels, polished. And his face and his uh, personality gave, gave me the opportunity to work uh, very free. And I tried to catch his character, his way of painting and deep cuts and somehow it's related to my work in, in the 60s. Of course the ancient Romans were some of the great early glass engravers and we're looking at now one of the Corning Museum's finest pieces of Roman engraved glass. It was made in the city of Rome sometime not long after the year AD 300. We know that from the shape, which is very distinctive of Rome, and from the style of engraving, which is equally typical of the city of Rome. What it shows is a scene from the New Testament, a scene that's recounted in all four Gospels, the miracle of Christ healing the paralytic and telling him to take up his bed and walk. I think it's a really a wonderful piece. And every time when I'm starting, uh, class here in, in the studio. The very first day we go with the students to the museum and especially looking at that piece and I am saying this is a top of engraving and every uh, body thinks the top of engraving must be Beeman or some late period. But uh, what I mean by saying that is that is a technique shown in the best way clearly and I would say the figures are an uh, example of a beautiful abstraction made by wheels. This is what is so important. The abstraction comes from the cutting from the shapes of the wheels. Mm. It's like a dialogue. You are doing your design but the wheel is teaching you how the exactly the shape should look like. I think they don't appreciate it immediately, mm -hmm. what I, I'm trying to get, because it's so rough, it's so primitive, and, and almost everybody is, is looking for this perfectness. So this is also a way not only about the technique, but also about the aesthetics, about the uh, art. So we are working on the diamond wheels and this plate is made for a print from glass. It's a 
picture of Milan Kundera, the Czech writer. I am very uh, interested in his books now, and so basically you can see that everywhere I, I used just flat wheels. This was a bigger one than I. Now I'm changing to a smaller one. So, if we are doing the, the sprints, we are even less concerned about a finish, because if it uh, shows the different textures uh, of the wheel, it's even better, and in the print, you can see many few details, marks, which you are unable to see in the glass. So this is a stone wheel, a aluminum oxide, and this is a fine piece of uh, carborundum. And this carborundum is for shaping and smoothing it out because the stone wheel, if it's soft like this, after a while not working, and the opposite to the diamond wheel or copper wheel with grit on it, this wheel is fine. It is also slow, it's quite very slow. So usually when we work with a stone wheel, we first cut it out roughly with a silicon carbide or a diamond wheel. Today, less and less are stone wheels used because you can get diamond wheels, also very fine ones. So fine that they replace the stones and of course with the diamond wheels you don't have so much trouble where you have to shape it again and again, you have to improve it again and again. A diamond wheel stays if it's a good wheel for your whole life. This is a copper wheel. That means that you don't work under water. You have to apply a mixture of a grit and oil on the wheel every time, otherwise it wouldn't work. The copper doesn't work by itself, only the grid. So this is a 90 grid, quite rough, so it takes quite fast. So this was the way the pieces we have seen in the museum have been made. And until recent, recently, I al also was uh, working as an apprentice only on copper wheels. And at home I'm working often the finish with copper wheels. But today more and more people are using uh, diamond wheels for practical reasons. On the other hand, the glass engravers uh, who are trained for copper wheels, they will never use for finishing uh, another than a copper wheel because you cannot be as sensitive and with details and with texture as uh, as with a copper wheel. It is very rough the texture. It's like a drawing. You are moving. With a if I would compare it with a pencil and paper, so I'm moving the paper against the pencil. It's a different feeling of a texture than 
from this stone or diamond cutting. An uh, apprentice at Stuben has to learn this six years. And then he's able to do uh, first, perhaps, engraving by himself. But it's, the skillness comes later. They're doing it for 30 years. And I myself, I'm doing it 60 years. <laughs> I started to teach 1960, also working, using this school as a base for my own work. And I believe the 60s everywhere, in France and here and even in Europe, in spite of all the borders, that was a decade of new ideas. I made a plate called Town, it was exhibited in London and everybody was amazed that this is an engraving, because just structured, structured, you know. And it was something new, and it was immediately the museum in Prague bought this piece, and I l left even the, the very simple uh, figurative uh, engraving behind for a while and started to do geometrical or expressive abstract engraving or cutting. It was again on the big wheel, huge pieces and deep, very deep carved. So uh, this was a total break with my, with my tradition. Under this uh, totalitarian regime, art was controlled, everything was controlled. But glass was like decoration. They said, oh, that's not important. Uh, we don't have to control it. It's just a piece of glass. And so it opened for all the glass people the opportunity to work with glass and, of course, abstract shape, abstract patterns, which couldn't be done in painting at the time. And also, another thing is, if there is a pressure on you, you, uh, you are working against this. So it created even more activity. It, the art became more powerful because if there is everything possible and easy, so it, there is no need to struggle for something. And there was a very strong need to, to, to go against this uh, uh, oppression. After this highlights of the 60s, we, we, be, we became a, a downfall <laughs> in the 70s. It was a totalitarian normalization, everything tight again. And I was fired from school because of my statements against this uh, invasion at the time. I made a medal and I was even condemned to prison for that. <laughs> I went back to the to Dominic Piemann and to, to, to the faces, to the figures, uh, because this uh, became more and more important to me to express something about the human beings, about the feelings, about emotions, passions, and so forth. And of course, if you are going back to think about uh, the most important uh, ideas, so y you can never pass the philosophers. You, you are always they are in the first row and of course many others also, musicians, writers and artists because they are always uh, expressing a kind of philosophy. Uh, my attitude to the portraits became more and more to picture these basic ideas, the basic characters, the feelings of the, of, of the people. Like uh, when I did Kafka, it was to express not only him, his, his face, but the whole time he lived in. It was the 20th century, this awful time of uh, absurdity. And he was anticipating this in his uh, books. And also, uh, somehow you can, you can find it in, in, uh, in the features of that face. The same with Beethoven his uh, solitude, his, his strong wish for happiness, uh, uh, which was hidden in, in a very severe features of his face. Uh, to me, the, the most important, and also 
messages, to get messages from the past, I would, I would pass on to the next generation. I think all, we are a link in a chain. When I came to, to Pilchak, one of the first books was Suzuki, uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I learned also about the Zen drawing. And I don't uh, pay attention to all the theory about Zen. I, I remember only a few things which are uh, to me important. To have a Zen mind means to be like a newborn child every day, keeping only, only what's important from the past. And the rest is open to accept. So this is a basic idea of this beginner's mind. It says, close your eyes, open your, your eyes, then you look at something, and if the thing is looking at you, you have the right contact, you know, with a tree or <laughs> something. And then, then, then the hand, in fact, you are not controlling the hand, not looking at the hand, and the hand is doing lines. And of course you are, you are looking at it and, and, and the somehow following uh, what what what's here? What you are seeing is is coming to, you, but in a different way than you would do it uh, if you would look at your pencil. But important is that it's always your lines. If you would exhibit it, you would recognize always your work, and the others are different. So there's something which talks about yourself, and this is important. And then there. Are uh, drawing it with a Dremel tool or with a wheel and printing it and is a kind of more showing the accident of what the wheel is doing than rather a very controlled cut. But some of the people are doing this <coughs> lines just because not every time it's necessary to, to make a sand drawing. You can start straight on a on a plate and moving it and do it like Jackson Pollock in a gesture way. And the prints are beautiful, sometimes uh, extraordinary. So it, that, that, that makes me happy that you know that you can you can push the people out of their way a little bit and uh, make them think about it. You have to accept commissions or or task or assignment and they have to solve problems. Today art is more like uh, fun often or, or a play or is, uh, spontaneous. So this, the solving uh, a certain problem is for instance to designing coins or doing uh, new medals because then you have to accept a uh, uh, certain motif, a certain uh, uh, theme, and, and you have to think about it and, and uh, solve it in a new way. Goethe would say, to limit yourself makes the master. But once you have a limitation, then you have to, to try to do the best in these limits. And to go, of course, to try to go over the limits, always. So this is, uh, uh, and also uh, to, to be able to compete with others and to, to go to uh, competitions means to be a lifetime student, to be, to be able to, to risk, uh, to, to, to give it to the jury and, and they will judge you. And I'm, I'm 70 years old, I'm doing it still. I, I'm doing these competitions every year um, four times. Uh, for 35 years already and I'm, I think I will do it perhaps 50 years because it, it makes me feel uh, also young as a student that I'm still uh, not afraid to lose because you cannot win all the time. With the coins, to me it's very uh, good because it's all very often portraits of people, of, of very important people. So I have I have another opportunity to learn about them more, to, to be acquainted with them, to learn about their ideas and their activities. And, and then I'm trying to, to do it like in, when I'm in driving class to, 
to get it in a, in a very simple lines, to make a long story short, as, as I often say. It's, it's, it's a dialogue between two different techniques. It's a dialogue with the, with the material I'm using, and it's always a dialogue with this thinking of the people from the past, and I like that. It's not about how long you work, but we are in a position that now we are starting. And all before was just a preparation for to do something. And we will perhaps never do it, but uh, this feeling is that it has, it, it is close, we are close, we are close, we have to catch it. Yeah. <laughs> I got a commission the very first year, and I spent that money from that commission for a other Czech engraver to come. And, and uh, my, my condition was that he has to do the same for the next, you know, to sell a piece. And, uh, so this is one thing. And the second, more important to me is <laughs> to be the Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> because I, I think uh, to celebrate Beeman, you have to do something for engraving, first of all. Then there will be more people appreciating Pima because they will learn how difficult it is, what he, what he really knew about engraving and so. So this is, <laughs> this is perhaps the, the happy end of my story, to be the, the journey I proceed for engravers, planting Merca laces everywhere. <laughs>